Nadat mijn hoogbegaafde zoon met schooltrauma was uitgevallen op het basisonderwijs en hierdoor een van de duizenden thuiszitters werd die Nederland rijk is, verslond ik alles wat ik over hoogbegaafdheid kon vinden. Want hoewel hoogbegaafdheid heel veel mooie kanten kent, kunnen onze kinderen het toch soms knap lastig hebben. Uiteindelijk besloten wij als gezin dat wij de kennis en ervaringen die wij hadden opgedaan wilden delen met andere ouders en leerkrachten, zodat de reis voor hen iets makkelijker zou worden. We doen dit via het boek Een Intense Reis, maar ook via deze podcast, waarin deskundigen op het gebied van begaafdheid hun kennis delen, want samen komen we verder. Dit is Een Intense Reis, de podcast, en mijn naam is Marije Hofland. Hi everyone, I'm so glad that everyone is listening again today. And today's guest has been on my guest list uh, for quite some time. And I met today's guest at a conference organized by Talentissimo. And she's such an inspirational and inspiring person that I just had to ask her to be on the podcast today. And today we will talk about the profoundly gifted. And I'm thrilled to be able to talk about this with my wonderful guest. Today's guest is P. Susan Jackson or Sue Jackson. Sue is a specialist in highly and profoundly gifted persons of all ages. She's the founder of the Damon Institute, where she supports the overall development of exceptionally and profoundly gifted people all around the globe. So with extensive clinical and developmental expertise supporting highly exceptional and profoundly gifted persons having completed over 80,000 hours of psychotherapy with this exceptional population. She is also a keynote speaker spreading her knowledge and being a beacon of hope and inspiration for gifted people everywhere. Sue is also an author, and I can't wait to read her upcoming book, Excuse Me, Where Do I Park My Will? The Extraordinary Journey of the Exceptionally and Profoundly Gifted. Sue, thank you so much for being here today. It's incredible. I'm so glad that we can have this conversation. I'm so delighted to be here. My first trip to the Netherlands, which was several years ago, I just was so welcomed and met by so many interested um, and sort of switched on professionals who I think always have the heart of the gifted child in mind. So thank you so much for including me in your podcast. Anytime, anytime. Yeah, like I said, today we're going to, to talk about the profoundly gifted and A lot of definitions about giftedness, they focus a lot about the cognitive aspects. And we were talking about this before we started this this recording as well, that the IQ, it almost always plays an enormous role in how people view giftedness. And there's also uh, also within the education system, but also in support for gifted people, there's a very high emphasis on achievement. Programs for gifted students, they, com- uh, they commonly have a very high focus on achievement and excellence, and they focus less on personal development and the well-being of the gifted people who are included in the program. And I think part of this is because people almost look at giftedness as in it equals a high IQ, but they lack the holistic view of what it means to be a gifted individual. And based on your 25 years of experience, you have developed your own model in which you present this holistic view of gifted people. Could you take us on your journey and what it actually entails in your well, eyes to be a gifted human? Yeah, I would love to. Um, I am and always have been a very deep and reflective thinker, even as a little girl. Uh, mm-hmm. When you saw pictures of me, I always look like I'm stepping back from the world and taking it all in and thinking. and. So um, I fell into the field of giftedness um, fortuitously, um, but in a way that um, kind of like 
woke me up. Um, I was someone who had moved ahead in school a couple of grades. I was mm -hmm. from a very um, intellectual, creative family. So I was very, very blessed. Um, but I didn't think anything of um, this idea of intelligence. It was sort of a given in our family, like not, not in a, a bad way, but just like learning. And, you know, you see all the books behind me. I have a library in my home. Uh, you know, learning was really big. But one day I met this boy that I call Michael and I was working at a high school as um, a counselor and teaching psychology. And I met this boy and he was extraordinary. And um, at the time that I met him, he was seriously, seriously depressed. And it was very, very obvious. And um, I went, I had a, a discussion with him, um, but he wasn't super responsive. He stayed in the room, but he, he mm -hmm. just kind of gave me yeses and nos. And I went home and I told my husband, um, oh, I really blew it. There was this beautiful, he happened to be an American boy. I live in Canada, but he was from the States. Um, and I couldn't connect to him. And my husband said, oh, I'm sure you did. Uh, maybe he just I wasn't used to your kind of temperament. And so the next day I went to work early and I opened the counseling center doors and somehow he had bribed the um, janitor to let him in early. And <laughs> I know it's so funny. And he said, you make so much sense. You make so much sense. And it took him like that whole night to think about it. And at that exact moment, I determined at that exact moment, I determined I will study this. I will study this. Uh, exceptional exceptional giftedness he actually had the highest scores it's kind of interesting i've ever seen and, wow. and I'm working for 25 years um he he was extraordinarily extraordinary probably plus 200 iq um and i decided this should never happen to any individual um no one should ever end up this depressed and that began began a whole journey for me in exploring this thing called intelligence so if you think about it my sort of flashpoint or my starting point came from a place of looking at the mental health so yeah. I couldn't help but all throughout look at a whole person, a whole person perspective on it. Um, and so there's many other tales that lead into where I began to create my model and maybe those will come up as we go. Um, but effectively I um, had studied, my mother was also a psych psychotherapist mm -hmm. and I had been brought up with the scholarly works of Jung as supper table topics. So again, I had a big, big head start, um, but I fell into the work of uh, a man called Ken Wilbur in mm -hmm. uh, he does integral psychology and it's sort of called the fifth wave in psychology post-humanistic um post-transpersonal even and integral psychology is this highly 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 integrated view on what makes humans human and how we can optimize living fully um, not only does it look at the human uh, being him or herself, but it also looks at the environments, all of the environments that we interact with. Um, and, and so I thought, okay, finally something that is big enough and inclusive enough that it will fit the highly, like the large whale like yes. <laughs> lines of the people that I'm, you know, I'm involved with that I feel so at home with in that population. And so I began this model and in this uh, model, again, reflecting integral psychology, there are 32 lines of development. Um, mm -hmm. It's it, it, starting with cognitive, uh, but also uh, the affect of our emotional line of development. There's a line of development we've studied called communicative capacity. And the little children that come here know all about this, like all about the model. They don't like um, sitting around talking about my model in some didactic form. Um, they have no interest. But if um, I see that there's some aspect of who they are that they're sort of slacking on, you know, they're not paying attention to their physical body or they're not um, paying attention in this case, communicative capacity, then I will gently um, urge an orientation towards that because I think it is um, both common sense and intuitive, but not reflected in our field that a whole system is affected by all aspects yes. of the system. And I think the reason uh, that our field has 
um, what did my friend Don Ambrose, who's the reigning um, political philosopher of gifted education, a very good friend of mine, he said the field is fractured, porous, and contested. Fractured, porous, and contested. And um, you can look up the article he wrote um, in that uh, extent. Um, and it is like because of two gifted experts sit down and talk, they're not talking about the same thing always. Absolutely. Like, the, yeah. very, the very thing itself. Um, yeah, like, there's no not even consensus on what giftedness no, actually no. is. No. Yeah nowhere no, ordinarily when i start my presentations i was just in slovenia mm -hmm. I, I will devote six slides in my deck to different um, perspectives or, or or definitions of giftedness because i draw from many many uh pools um but quickly back to my model um so so we have communicative capacity cognitive affective gender is a whole line of development sexuality is a whole line of development when i say a lot of development it's something you can study in and of itself and it moves each of these lines move up in levels of complexity yes and, um they as as a person moves through these lines of development they become more and more integrated so a really really big big key of my model is this notion of integration the model itself is called integral practice for the gifted and again emphasis on practice integral yeah. practice for the gifted so when i'm working with the kids i'm like what are you doing uh daily what are you all about daily it's not about an achievement down the road it is what are you doing as a whole human being um and and they know that um so if you look at all these lines of development one of the lines of development ken wilber studied was called ideas of the good and so mm -hmm. it's like a moral ethical uh, line of development, like what is your notion of uh, ideas of the good or what is right and good and true. And for profoundly gifted children, they come into the world with a very elevated consciousness. Yes. They're not just like um, rats that run the maze faster than all the other rats in a, in a said maze. If you look at giftedness as just intelligence and problem solving and, and, and that kind of thing, they are asking, why are we in the maze? What is the maze? How can the the uh, the uh, beings in the maze representing the world if in this metaphor, how can we work together? They come with a very trans personal orientation um which is is from birth from earliest ages they are oriented towards um how can we work together how can i as a human being contribute so their ideas of the good are elevated so if you think that cognitively they are born profoundly if the kids are born way advanced um, uh, we're doing uh, research here right now, and we've been collecting data on what the profoundly gifted little infant is like. Mm -hmm. They they come into the world at um, developmental levels of a three month old or a four month old. Um, my own son, I love to tell this story. He was a very big baby. He was 11 pound baby. And um, when he was born, he immediately looked people in the eyes in the delivery room. Mine too. Mine too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he wasn't even five minutes old and he would lift his neck and he would look around. Yeah. And the people in the delivery room, the people in the hospital, they would actually gather all the other people saying, you know, this is not, this is normal. You must go and see what just happened. Yeah, yeah. And it's I remember um, my daughter was is older than my son. And that's another tale. I'll stick with my son. But I remember when because uh, she also showed this developmental advance, but but in a very different way. Mm -hmm. uh, but my son looked at everyone in the eyes like he was almost like, thank you for coming. Appreciate your efforts like that, like a very social kind of like if you think about it in the same with your offspring, uh, a very social, social engagement. And that's really yeah. important to think about when I'm addressing my model, because I knew I remember uh, it being in that delivery room and I remember thinking, OK, this little being is already oriented towards connecting to other beings yeah. in a way that is um, embracing, in a way that is welcoming. 
right? And so then I picked him up and he was really huge, right? And he, he fully could lift his head up. He had little pec muscles, little little abdominal muscles. He was a little freak of nature. And um, I patted him on the back the way mothers timelessly have done. And he patted me back, immediately patted me back. And wow. so it wasn't just, and he was obviously he at 11 pounds, he was a, maybe a week overdue. Um, he was physically also very advanced. Um, uh, but it, so we had the cognitive, but we also, he was physically very advanced. And he turned out to be a very highly elite athlete as well as being a profoundly gifted guy. Um, so, but I remember in that moment, it was like the moment I had with Michael, um, you know, and, and I remember thinking, okay, this is something that we need to be studying. So uh, circling back from my model for, for a moment back to get that education and where it is um, distinctive in, in my view, there are other people mm -hmm. with models for sure, but overall the field has moved to a field that is interested in how we offer programs yes. for, for children um, that is inclusive in, in, in thank goodness that we are looking at the inclusive part of it, mm -hmm. that children of all, all backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, all races, um, uh, um, cultural backgrounds, different languages can, can have access to a program because I yeah. think, especially in the U.S., I think there was an emphasis on it, depending on what zip code you were in, where you lived, and what the funding formula was like. Yeah, to, it, 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 it's getting it, better here, but it's still a problem. Yeah. Also, because people from like non-Western backgrounds, they just don't get selected for the gifted programs. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Or, or Aboriginal kids, I can think of here in Canada. Um, I, I used to be um, a district coordinator for the gifted. It's important to know mm -hmm. when you're listening that I was not only a teacher of the gifted, but I also was a coordinator or administrator for the gifted. And I remember this one Aboriginal boy, and it was so obvious how gifted he was. He just kind of shone with his intelligence but he had um all kinds of anomalies in his processing systems so we might call it dyscalculia or difficult mm. difficulty with numbers he had a form of stealth dyslexia difficulty um reading in a way that didn't cost him tons of energy just to read but i knew how brilliant he was and he had a very intuitive intuitive way of being in in the world um, it, you know, in sync with our Aboriginal populace here in Canada, but he was completely overlooked um, in terms of identification systems prior to me coming on board um, because he couldn't perform academically. Yes. In, in a way that people would expect. And so the field, circling back, the field has moved towards a model where it, it kind of opens the doors at, at every juncture for people who can perform in certain areas. But it's moved away from my exact definition of giftedness, which is that it's, a, it's an innate developmental integrative higher level of consciousness like these kids come into the world with a higher level of communicating a higher level of emotion a higher level of the cognitive right yeah they come into the into the world with all of that and because we've had to really fight in gifted education to get room in the arena is a bona fide recognized uh, supported area of education, then we've had to kind of uh, go for definitions and models that will be accepted. Um, and um, I think at our peril, uh, because when, if we don't support, in my case, the profoundly gifted child from, from jump, from the very beginning, even in preschool programs and into, into the school system, they can become profoundly injured. And if you think about those two little babies, our two little offspring that were born, like very connected in the world, they're also very, um, the higher you move in human conscious, the more subtle your kind of interaction, like it's very subtle, it's very complex. And it's very easy to damage someone with that kind of subtlety, that kind of sensitivity. And so my research shows that um, profoundly gifted children, little children, can be injured as young as 18 months old, um, two years old, psychic injuries. Um, yeah. I have a little girl that I see now who's just an absolute delight, but she had uh, what we call agoraphobia. At four years old, she couldn't leave her home 
Um, she's uh, Chinese British, as it happens. I work with people all over the world. Um, and she couldn't leave her home because um, what had happened when she went out into the world and came in with this, this kind of interactive way of being and this really sharp mind and high cognitive, um, it, people couldn't sort of contend with that in this little person. And she didn't have this sort of typical, um, you know, I don't know what you would want to call it, sort of nerd profile, you know. I find my boys who have a mathematical propensity um, are the first to be recognized in, in yes. school because it's sort of the stereotypical yeah. idea of what high intelligence is. But this little girl, she happens to be an all-rounder. She's good. I just saw her two days ago. She's good across the board. Um, but she's very, very good in, in, in writing, for instance. She's got an innate sense of human psychology. She's just sharp that way. But she's good across the board. But um, she just didn't get recognized. And so it didn't take more than two sessions to solve for the anxiety underlying the agoraphobia. Um, and then I began to teach her how to work with all those lines of development um, so that she could be robust and resilient in the world, even while being uh, uncommon. So. Yes, yeah. I'm listening to what you're saying and that's actually, it's pretty much in line with what happened with our son that uh, once we started primary school, he was basically not being seen anymore and he was he was actually traumatized by the school system and he wasn't able to go to school for two years wow. and i see that happen to um a lot of uh, gifted and profoundly gifted people here in the netherlands and i think it's really important the holistic view that you're presenting which also includes like the high the different way that that they perceive uh, like emotions um, that that's also really important and what they see as right or wrong that that's just something that they knew they know from a very young age and that actually bothers them uh, to such a high extent when things are not being fair and things are not going um, you know as they feel it, it is is right, fair, honest, yeah. uh, according to their values, which they already have very, very strong and clear values from a really uh, young age. Um, do you feel that these children are also more likely to be uh, traumatized or feel anxiety within our society and within the school system because they're so sensitive. No, oh, yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. We made a documentary here at our institute several years ago um, mm -hmm. called Rise: um, The Extraordinary Journey of the Exceptionally and Profoundly Gifted, and um, um, in it uh, we established uh, really, really clearly there were ten. 10 people participated from all over the world. Um, we established clearly that um, this, this heightened, heightened sensitivity um, can become damaged like really early, like really, really early. And, and sometimes we, there's an adage that we use here and it's called once is a pattern. Um, yes. Because in an, in an ordinary classroom, if you're going to teach a new concept, you need to have seven to 10 repetitions for children to get the concept. The exceptionally or profoundly gifted child will get it on the first go. And they sometimes will have already got it while you're just giving the explanation. You haven't even given them the formula or the kind of key keystroke in the idea. They mm -hmm. will just it. So if once is a pattern for them cognitively, once is a pattern for them emotionally too and morally like there's this notion of moral injury um, that's in the literature now where um, something occurs uh, in the individual's immediate world or in the world at large that the child knows about um, and they they feel it is an injury or to use yeah. the vernacular of the current day a trauma um, and and it, it 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 sort of can infect or inflame all those other lines of development um, central to my model uh, is this notion of the self. So if we have all these 32 lines of development, then there's the core self, which yes. is 
the very thing that science has not been able to pinpoint, like what is, what, you know, how can we define consciousness? We know that gifted brains, um, the latest neuroscience tells us that gifted brains communicate very effectively across all the brain regions. Uh, we used to think that maybe it was one area, but now we know that it's like a, a high um, efficiency within all of the systems. The corpus callosum connecting the right and the left brain is highly efficient mm -hmm. in the brain. Um, and so, but we we can't determine this idea of self, but the self is that, that sort of essence of the individual and every human being has a self um, and Anna Marie Roper who came before me who was a very good friend of mine wrote an entire book on the self and how she felt that was absolutely central to her notion of giftedness and I had already developed my model when I met her so we had a great time uh, talking together um, but the self of the gifted child is idiosyncratic it is unique to that person that individual and the 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 role of the self in my model is to coordinate all those lines of development but yeah. it's it's like an orchestra it's only as strong as its weakest link like so if the percussion section is out in the orchestra we're not going to have the same sound or the same effect in in the world for people listening and so it is with our um our experiences in life as a gifted person. So we have to support the self of the child. And you know, having or raising, I guess, um, a gifted boy, is it? I think it's a boy. A boy yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, that they come into the world with such a distinctive, like unique um, uh, sense of themselves that they feel tremendous loyalty to. If they're not broken, they feel tremendous fidelity to this yeah. core self. And that's what we support. And the thing that's extraordinary about the model that I have uh, been working on for over 30 years is that when you support that self, when you deeply listen to who that child is, that unique consciousness, a lot of things sort of self-correct, right? When you remind them that, oh, your kinesthetic um, line of development is also very important and we'll call this guy Johnny Johnny so you need to have a physical component to what you're doing and so um, I just have extraordinary case studies where when you support the self of the individual and they're working in all these areas of development their achievements are through the roof they're they do amazing things as a byproduct of being integrated is a byproduct of having their core self seen. So it's the exact opposite of trauma. Would you say that that's the most, because you say when they're not broken, yeah. would you say that uh, I assume that a lot of the gifted individuals who come into your practice, they um, first see you and they feel broken. They are broken. Would you say that um, this journey to find yourself and to know what it is you need in order to be able to be your authentic self, that that may be one of the most important things to um, become unbroken, to become whole again and to thrive as a gifted individual. Yeah, oh, oh, 100%. Um, uh, what's really interesting about my practice is that people often will come because there is a, a, a problem or a complexity that isn't working in them, um, but they'll often stay involved with me for many, many, many years, mm -hmm. so that probably 60% of my work is developmental support for their profound giftedness, where they come in and um, they've moved through these stages of life and now they're, they're, they're hungry to kind of like move out and find out more about themselves. And again, I come back to the self. So by, there's a young man in that I've actually known since he was five years old and he's 19. And um, he has done some education and done extremely well and he's explored this and that but he came in the other day and somehow i just knew i had to be at my deepest of listening and not say very much and um i did that and then um 
his mom contacted me later and said that he just felt like a different human being when he left because it was like everything just lines up again and, and a lot of the great thinkers the great philosophers as as far back as socrates who said know thyself yes. uh, yeah, but um, Carl Rogers, Rollo, Rollo May, all of these great, great thinkers come to mind that reflecting that core self and helping them find their authentic self is super, super, super important. I have a couple of other things that I think are equally important is one is for the individual individual to develop self-discipline or rigor mm -hmm. with cells. So um, in all the lines of development, cognitive being one it's important to be able to apply rigor to what you are learning um, to how do you add fast to be yeah steadfast. how do you deal with because i assume that when a lot of individuals who come into your office they are broken there may be trauma some of them may so show signs of uh, dissociation and you know have really low motivation how do you approach the step for them to to take control over their own life and to to develop that that sense of self-discipline yeah well that can sometimes be a very long journey yes and and sometimes i've actually had people integrate in one hour it's extraordinary i had one girl fly in from new york to see me and i knew i didn't have a lot of time with her um, and so in one hour, we somehow pulled it together. Um, but I'm just going to pull into my own mind um, the last three people that I did intakes on um, where they came in with significant clinical presentations, disassociation, um, high depressive states and, and whatever. So you begin with just, just having them share where they're at. But the person that is listening cannot have in their mind an outcome. They can't have, it's the complete opposite of some of the um, cognitive behavioral approaches, which I yeah. also I also use, of course. Um, but this kind of deep, deep listening and deep connection is just to just stay present to, to who, who they are and what they've experienced. And so again, I trust the self of all individuals, um, but I, in, in a therapeutic set, setting, I trust that that self, if it's deeply reflected, then that will itself be a healing, a healing experience. Um, and there are many um, psychotherapies that believe that that reflection in that authentic listening in itself is, is very, very healing. Um, yeah. What's interesting, I can think, I'm being very careful to kind of meld cases together so i'm not talking about one person yes. it, yeah just so that it, um i would of course never say a name but i also don't want to reveal a personality but i can think of this one situation where a young man had been horribly tra uh, traumatized in grade two by a teacher who um couldn't understand him at all was very annoyed with how he could just um perform on tests but was otherwise kind of vacant feeling and so he had been horribly traumatized and he's a very musical young man um, i would say musically profoundly gifted and what was so fascinating is i worked and worked and worked with him because there's a musical line of development is um, we would go through something very deep in conversation or in maybe art therapy where he's just drawing his feelings or even movement or play therapy. I use all kinds of ways to communicate. Yes. Um, he would then, every time he reached a new level, he'd take on a new instrument. So at one point he was playing the accordion in the waiting room for Christmas. But imagine Christmas carols on an accordion. It was very funny. Um, and he took that instrument up. And then at another point, he um, um, took up most recently, he's taken up the saxophone. He's taught himself the flute. He plays the piano. And I mean, at an extraordinary level. But what would happen for him to integrate it all, he would have to work through that musical line of development. Um, and I know at some point, there'll be other lines he can use but for now as he was healing from the trauma he had to use his really yeah. kind of core gift which i also find fascinating because i think that um some kids come into the world very multi-potential 
Um, so they have all kinds of gifts. And some some kids come into the world with one or two gifts that are their strongest gifts. Um, and yeah, it's just fascinating to me. But the, the deep listening and also with years and years of experience, I probably know what questions to ask and when. And I think pace is very, very important. Um, there's a time to be um, a little bit demanding with a person who's healing and and ask them to kind of step into the room a little bit more and yeah. hear something a little a little more with a little more clarity we'll say and there's a time to be very 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 patient uh, because trauma as you know can be extremely debilitating and system wide it can show up in your whole system yeah the word the word that comes to mind when you're talking like uh, about the way you approach situations where people are experiencing trauma, but also the, the music, the word that comes to mind that seems to be very important is the word connection, being connected with life again, with all with human beings, with um with music. And I know that in your uh, in your keynote at Talentissimo you were also talking about the cosmos and spirituality yes, yes. being, yeah, playing a really large role uh, in this as well. And I remember when I saw you back then, I was recovering from uh, cancer. I'd actually just had uh, surgery uh, back then. Um, and I was going through this whole personal development face and asking all kinds of questions like um, how is my spirituality and the connection that I feel towards nature, towards life, towards the cosmos, is that somehow related to um, being gifted to um, uh, trauma and the way that I experience things like trauma and anxiety and things like that. And there you were <laughs> talking Aww. about this in your keynote. And I was like, ah, I'm not crazy. No, These I... are actually va valid questions that I'm, I, yeah. I'm asking here. And that was such a relief to me because I felt like, you know, I was out there, you know, th that I was asking these questions that people would just, um, yeah, feel are too out there and then you were mentioning them as well so that has made an incredible difference for me at the time you were nodding when i was talking about you know that spirituality and that connection to the cosmos also playing a role in what we just discussed that that connection to life and that that's what you need to recover from trauma and also to find that self uh we're talking about could you elaborate on that yeah, a absolutely. bit more how do you see that now i remember where you were sitting in the audience <laughs> i know exactly you were to my left and you're yeah. sitting beside a woman with dark hair i remember exactly yeah. who you were <laughs> uh, i'm so glad i'm so glad that that's made an effect um, I'll give a little bit of a technical explanation and then move into a more of a lyrical or um, poetic interpretation of what you're asking. So in the model, I talked about everything moves up in levels of development. And so if you think about it, let's say a, a child is fortunate enough to not have tons and tons of injuries or I suppose fortunate to heal from injuries if they have them, which sometimes catapults you up a level. Um, and the Dabrowski theory um, really would address that idea. Um, but as you move to higher and higher levels of consciousness, you become more and more and more transpersonal in your views. You become more and more aware of yourself as a, a part of a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful mosaic, which is life or the universe um, and I tell my kids you're just a tiny dot in the spectrum of the universe and they're like what and I go you are you're this little tiny dot and I said but each dot is incredibly important 
because it forms the whole. And it, it's sort of a dialectical interpretation of identity because gifted kids are always asking, what is, why were we born? What is my purpose? But if you think about it in just very simple terms, without one dot, there is no whole. And so mm. each dot in, in life is incredibly important. And so gifted children um, will come into the world with that orientation. And it kind of can come into the world in a bit of a neophyte or a germinal state. Um, I'll introduce my daughter a tiny bit here, who is an artist and a humanitarian. And she she actually flew into um, Slovenia to hear me speak because she was on her way yeah. to Paris. Yeah, I saw her in the Netherlands <laughs> as well. She was with yeah. you as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, our, our careers are such that we can meet in Paris or meet in England or come to the Netherlands. and. So when she she was very different from her brother, she was very contained at birth, like a little Madonna, like just sort of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. um, and she showed this remarkable art talent really early, which quite frankly, as a parent was a bit um, daunting. I didn't I didn't know even with all my expertise, I was like, I remember thinking this must be handled very carefully. And, and I, I extend this to all the families out there. When a child shows a profound gift, we must really pay attention to it. And, and, and sort of, I call it the daemon. Socrates yeah. referred it, to it as the daemon, which is deeply connected to the self. So basically the idea is you come into the world and there's these ways you have of connecting to the highest level or spiritual essence of all of existence but it manifests in certain ways um so it, with my daughter she was always picking up trash when we were out at the at, you know the county fair or walking in a park she'd pick up trash and we thought oh what, what is this a little environmentalist like what is she and then she would come home and she would make creations out of them um even when she was really really little um and she had several experiences um throughout her life where she was very shy as a little girl but she would stand up for somebody or something yeah. like out of nowhere and mm -hmm. and she just wouldn't back down and um we used to say uh, to each other um as she was growing she seems to need a whole country to run like a whole she needs such bigger opportunities and bigger influences because it was obvious that the little things she was doing were connected to a sense of a principle a spirituality a consciousness that was way beyond four years old five years old and and it's funny now because she is out there in the world doing very her latest thing has been uh, a child labor law that's going to be enacted here in Canada. And wow. she's presenting with the prime minister, um, her painting. Um, I'm not sure when the date of all of this is, but um, so um, so anyway, as you move to these higher level of consciousness, it's a it's a very transpersonal there. It, it's it's a very much an I thou um, perspective, which is another way of looking at it. The children see other people it, not as objects to be moved around, but is, is an entity just as important as their little dot and to be re regarded in that way. So as all those levels move up, so at the highest level of communicative capacity, for example, um, I've got one boy right now who's at a university somewhere and he sits down regularly with the president of the university um, and he was helping uh, with the COVID uh, policies um, because he just has an extraordinary ability to communicate now. And the punchline is, you know, he's 17 years old and he's finishing his bachelor's degree. So he's way advanced, but he's way advanced in all areas of development the one with him that was hardest to get him to buy into at first was the physical to have a daily practice yeah. of movement and being in nature because all of these integrate all of these integrate but once he kind of caught on to that once my kids catch on to how powerful this is they don't want to leave any of their areas behind they want to work on all of them oh, this just gives me goosebumps <laughs> Um, and I love that, you know, um, he seems to have found his place uh, at university and he's actually being seen, being recognized and being allowed uh, to be his full self. How was that with your daughter? I can imagine that, uh, I mean, you understood and your family understood, but th there must have been a lot of people around her who just didn't accept 
that kind of behavior from a four-year-old? Yeah. Uh, yeah, she was um, oftentimes misunderstood. I hope she doesn't mind me saying that, but um, she was just oftentimes very misunderstood. And partly because um, uh, she's um, an introverted personality and in that she processes everything internally yeah. um, before she puts it out there. And it's not now that um, she's in her 30s um, now, and it's not that she, oh, she's what we call a pistol in Canada, like she can hold her own in terms of standing up for human rights or whatever. She she and I are both supposed to be speaking at the UN coming up actually on, on issues of relating to women worldwide. We're just waiting to hear about that. So she's very good, but she was hugely misunderstood, partly because she didn't put out what she was thinking and feeling easily until mm -hmm. it hit a point or or uh, um, a turning point where she felt she had to stand up, which you juxtapose that with our son who was born communicating. Like uh, he has, um, and it's not that our daughter doesn't now, but as a child, she was much more internal. Um, so yeah, she was misunderstood a lot of the way. Um, I think her art always shocked people she was highly accelerated in art. Yeah, um, very expressive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she, it's amazing. She captures, like I was, I forget the essence. what. essence. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I was in Slovenia, I didn't, I, I sometimes forget that, you know, she's quite well known or something. And I said, oh, we have a daughter. And then everyone started putting their hands up and saying her art is like the soul. And I was like, oh, yeah, maybe some of you have seen it. Um, but yeah, she was she just captures that. So she was she was misunderstood a lot of the time um, for what her needs even were. Um, yeah. So it, it was it was difficult. I, I again, I go back to my math kids. I, I have a lot of kids here at the clinic um, who are wildly accelerated in mathematics they're doing calculus at eight years old you know which is like you know fourth year university stuff they're doing at eight years old and they're they're more easily recognized for being profoundly gifted but then then comes in all of the falsehoods and yeah. myths about what would work for that kind of a child you know like oh he couldn't be accelerated that'll be hard on his social when in fact the child's social is um, concomitant with all aspects of who he is. It's in line with all aspects of who he is. So again, how do you work with that? You work with that, I call it radical programming. Radical means back to the core. That's a Latin meaning of it, back to the core. Mm -hmm. So you figure out kind of what the core self needs. So maybe that little guy needs to be um, studying at university for part of his math, and then maybe needs to be in a chronological age for some things. Um, I've got several kids doing that, where they do choir or physical education with kids their age, and then maybe they do other aspects of their education at another level. So it requires great system flexibility and cooperation, yeah. but why? in the world, and I mean in the world, would we not want to offer flexibility and understanding for the most um, elevated, the most potentiated of all human potential? Because those are gonna be the people that can help solve the world problematic as we yes. know. They're gonna be the people that can, can, can encourage communication across cultures, et cetera, et cetera. What is your experience uh, within the education system worldwide? Do we allow these, you know, wonderful people, um, do we allow them to be their core self and do we give them enough, to, enough space? Do we see them enough to be their core self for them to thrive or? It, it's actually quite the opposite. And as I yeah. say, in one day, I could be working in Israel. I had a guy in Belgium. You know, I, I work all over the world, uh, and it is actually tragic. Um, yes. And it comes down to the basic premise that what you don't fully understand, you can fear. It's just human nature. It, it goes back to the earliest times. You fear what you don't know because it could cause you harm. And then, and then, 
if you fear something, then you can develop a whole sort of set of myths around something that you're not able to understand. And that's where we're at with our brightest kids. Um, actually, one of my boys was attending a school in um, the US that was a school for the highly gifted, but he's profoundly gifted. So he's a couple standard deviations beyond these highly gifted kids. So he's as different from them as they are from an average kid. Um, and he kept begging me, he goes, please fly to wherever it was um, and work with the staff because they they don't understand me. And he irritated them because mm -hmm. he often he often as once as a pattern, he often knew things without being told. He would get fixated on some complex integrated problem at the expense of his you know, regular rote kind of learning that he had to do in some areas. And I'm not against the kids having to develop rigor. I'm not against that at all. But again, go back to what I said, the system needs flexibility to understand what processes are at work. So for every profoundly gifted kid, I wish they had someone in their building or someone mm -hmm. in their town that could be an anchor point for them who could help them. And, and, and almost explain to other people what's going on with this child. Um, so yeah, they're horribly misunderstood and horribly underserved. And like people ask me, is there anywhere in the world? I, I was just yeah. on my on the way to Slovenia. I spoke at a school called Grayson School for the Gifted in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, Melissa Bylash is doing a, a, a very, and her team, she's got a great team, are doing a very good job of paying attention to the needs of the profoundly gifted. And as part of that, I fly in hopefully every year and I do a five day in service with parents and the staff. And um, I work with the profoundly gifted kids themselves and they're doing radical programming. They're placing the kids where they need to be. But even with all of their knowledge, it requires like weekly tweaking and really good communication. And, and I teach them, the kids I work with to be um, their own advocates in a respectful, nuanced, um, um, informed way to be advocates for themselves and, and what they need. And again, I teach them you're part of a system um, and the teachers may or may not fully understand what your educational needs are. I think one of the greatest things in working with these kids is you have to recognize there's human beings that come into the world more complex than anything you could ever imagine. They may know more than you'll ever know. And yeah. so humility is a really big part of working with them as well. Yeah, and I think it's really important for them to learn how to self be their own advocate. Because, you know, I often see that these kids depend so much on individuals whether they thrive or not. Like sometimes there's like half a year in their lives that they really thrive and they really, but it always seems to de depend on the individuals that are there who truly see a child and who are, um, you know, who just want to be an advocate for them and make sure that doors are opened that they need. Um, and it hurts me really, really bad that they don't necessarily get what they want, but it all depends on people uh, being willing to uh, think out of the box and think beyond the standard system that we all came up with. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like, and it's 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 um, it's terrifying to think that an individual's right to develop. Yeah and to be educated and to contribute because they're very big on contributing is going to depend on just chance mm, yeah you, you know whether they have the right person actually the boy that started me onto this whole field his story goes like this like he was imagine post 200 iq he's brilliant mm -hmm. and he was like yeah i could read and write and do numbers at like two and a half three and you know at four they recognized i was very brilliant and then when I was in kindergarten, they were like, oh, he's really brilliant. They'll move him up a grade. But they weren't actually doing anything to help integrate or to work with all of who he was. And he was very lonely. 
you know, there was, there was no other little kids like him that they were working with. So by grade three, he's now determined to be behaviorally disordered because mm -hmm. he's, he's acting out because his emotional self is just withering away to nothing. And so if you think about the model, if that emotional self isn't functioning, then we learn about emotions and about our social self through human exchange. Yeah. So he, he's just, he's in trouble because he doesn't have anyone to do that with. And then by, by grade five, they said he had attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or mm. ADHD. Oh, okay, hang on a minute, folks. You say this is an eight attentional issue. Okay, let's look at what his environment has done or not done for him. And his anxiety was through the roof at that point. And when your anxiety is through the roof, your ability to focus and your ability to, to have an executive function that can carry on in the world, all connected to what we know of as ADHD, is shot. He, he couldn't do it. And so I, and his story kept going like that. Oh, then in grade six, a new teacher came in who understood profound giftedness. So now he's gifted again. And, and someone challenged the ADHD diagnosis or said, maybe it's more anxiety. So then that was a pretty good year. Grade eight, he was now behaviorally disordered again because they lost the program. It's tragic. Yeah. It is really tragic. And you see that a lot. And they more often than, uh, than not, they make a child feel that there's something wrong with them, that they should adjust when it's not, there's nothing wrong with them. Yeah. But we need to allow them to find that authentic self and allow them to, um, yeah, to, to have what they need in order to thrive. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and that leads to another point that we should underscore. And that is the need for true peers. They yeah. need, they need an opportunity to be with other like-minded individuals. Actually, I have a funny story. There's a guy that's coming here and he is eight years old and he is doing calculus. So I'm having the parents put together this very um, complex system. And so I said, he really, really needs a mentor, someone at the university level that can work with him and just explore, um, you know, higher level physics, explore chemistry, explore mathematics, explore um, excellent literature, whatever. So the mother is really working hard to pull all this together. And so then he tells me he has a, a mentor and I'll just make up a name. He calls him Patrick. And I said, oh, this Patrick sounds great. And I'm picturing in my head, um, the boy is eight. I'm picturing in my head like, a guy my son's age, like in his early 30s, who's doing a PhD, and they go for walks together. And it turns out the guy's in his 80s. And, um, and wow. my, this is the best part of my kid's week, because like, he gets to go and sit down with Patrick and just discuss things. And Patrick also understands the need for rigor. So he gives him assignments. And he, 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 he asks him to step into that. Um, self-discipline but he's like in his 80s and just the way he discussed um, his interactions I thought it was like a little playmate my point being that true peers can be of any age and any background um, and if in the system in the Netherlands there's any opportunity to group highly profoundly gifted kids together even if it would have to be across districts or whatever it is life-saving it is yeah. life -saving. Yeah, I think there should be a lot more focus on that because um, right now there are peer groups within the Netherlands, but they're all also age group based and they're all like highly uh, and profoundly gifted individuals all together in one group. But the difference can be can be a lot. So it's not like they're groups of all ages. And I love your example that, you know, you don't even have to be the same age. No, not at all. You could be like an eight-year-old boy, you know, discussing mathematics or discussing the universe or whatever astronomy with an 80-year-old man. And it would 
would it would make your day and it would make you feel seen and it would allow you to yeah to basically be yourself and recover your motivation and being able to show what you've got and i think that that's really important to emphasize as well because i think that there are a lot of people who are just not open to that and maybe uh, eight-year-olds and 80 year old is extreme but also uh you pictured in your head that 30 year old man who could be you know a peer for a profoundly gifted child so he can thrive but i think a lot of people and parents it's just for a lot of people it's frowned upon it's like you know what what should a 30 year old individual do with an eight-year-old boy and i think it's very good to emphasize that that's something that that something is sometimes just what they need because it's it is really 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 difficult to find your peers and their lifesavers they're essential they absolutely are i i have at the clinic we could have someone fly in to see me from the netherlands and then in the same waiting room could be someone who drives two hours every two weeks from the US because I, I live very close to the American border. And it's so funny to me because across language, across gender, across background, even across language, they recognize each other. And it's immediate, it's immediate. And there's a curiosity and there's an acceptance. Sometimes, however, if they've been really traumatized, they will act a little defensive because mm -hmm. they're too afraid to put themselves out there, their authentic self out there with someone who appears to be quote unquote on their wavelength or similar to them, because what if that person rejects them? So um, yeah. a, large, a large part of what I do is um, uh, hopefully being sensitive enough to see the defense mechanisms that people have put mm -hmm. into place to survive in the world. As part of my book, I once interviewed one of the founders of neuroscience and um, I flew to Florida from Canada to meet him. And very unfortunately, he was on his last last days of his life because he, oh. he was very sick and he was in his 80s. Um, but we had this amazing conversation. And at first he was kind of rude with me, to be honest. You know, he, he kind of repelled me, even though he knew that I was there to talk with him. But after a couple of days, he he grew comfortable with me. And he, he I think he 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 discovered I wouldn't try to harm him or treat him like a subject, you know, that I'm studying an object I'm studying. Um, and he said, oh, I developed protective camouflage. He said very early, I learned to change my vocabulary, to change um, my um, you know, my deep inner thoughts to not share them with anyone because they wouldn't be understood. They might be laughed at. Um, and, and again, human beings from time immemorial, what they don't understand, they may fear and what they fear, they may defend against. And so that sensitive, sensitive gift a child becomes a thing people are defending against. Even teachers will do that without realizing they're doing it. Um, uh, because they, it, how often do you run across a profoundly gifted kid? Um, I'll talk to doctors all the time and they said, oh, I had this kid and he was so different. And I said, oh, he's in this um, small subset of humanity called the profoundly gifted. Um, we seem to do much better with them after they're long gone. We're like, oh, mm. that, that Albert, he was a real little firecracker, Albert Einstein. But if you... But if you were the poor teacher that had him in class when he was or wasn't paying attention, um, it might not have the same welcoming feel to it, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Do you feel that, uh, you know, that mirroring, like mirroring yourself uh, in other individuals is something that we need in order to have good self-esteem and in order to be able to know an experience that we can be safe with other people and we don't need that mask in order to protect ourselves. Oh, 100%. And that that's 
that's very, very, I find it very tricky for me now because sometimes when people meet me, they'll almost be shocked at how quickly I can see who they are. Mm -hmm. um, but if you think about it, I've been doing this a long time and I've been working with the greatest of individuals who've been also my teachers. Uh, I, I feel that every hour that I work, I should be learning something um, from the individual. I should be surprised. I should challenge myself and think, oh, what I thought yesterday is not what I'm thinking today because this individual has added another dimension to my thinking. But that said, like the ability to mirror them is, and I mean from, from the beginning, like even when I walk into the waiting room, um, I'll, I'll take a note of, you know, um, their body language or just their eye contact or the, um, the depth of their voice, how strong their voice is sounding. And I'll try to mirror back, but ever so subtly, because if I do it too strongly, it's yeah. almost shocking to them. So it's ever so subtly. And um, I was reading yesterday um, a piece of research um, from neuroscience on laughter as a potent, potent uh, healing force. And like, honestly, if you're at my clinic, all you can hear all day long is laughter. You can just hear it like, because very, very bright people often have very, very incredible senses of humor because yeah. humor, humor involves taking other perspectives on things, which if they're not super, super broken, they can do that easily. So I, we're just laughing all day long, but really significant clinical work is going on. But I think laughter is very important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I love the fact that you are able to go to Florida and be that mirror for, you know, the, the, the professor, the man that you met there so that he was able to experience this just before he moved on basically that yeah. yeah must have been yeah the the universe must have had a plan yeah it was incredible it was very um um overwhelming for me yeah because uh, i didn't realize how sick he was when i went down there mm -hmm. um but um and so after the first day my husband came with me so after that first day, I debriefed with him and then I decided, like, no matter what, I'm going to try to just be the best mirror I can be for this individual. And um, yeah, he was an incredible guy, one of the founders of neuroscience. Lovely, lovely person. Incredible. Sue, I really want to thank you for this wonderful podcast. I think we touched upon a lot of things I could talk to you for hours, but mm -hmm. you know, I know that there are other people who are waiting for you as well. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you still want to address in this podcast? I, I just want to, I, I guess, speak to all of the parents that are out there. Like I, I don't glibly state, oh, it's very difficult without every night before I go to sleep thinking about how important it is for all of us in this field, whether it's the gifted education uh, model operating in Canada or the US or mm -hmm. the people in your country. I think it's incredibly important that we work together. So just like yes. the little kids that I work with, I have this sense that it's important that we all link, that all those little dots become this giant, giant mosaic of care and intention and um, um, support for these incredible individuals. So if you're out there as a parent, um, please know there are people working on your behalf. I think those are incredible last words and it brings us back to how everything is connected. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Dit was weer een aflevering van een intense reis, de podcast. Fijn dat je luisterde. Heb je naar aanleiding van deze aflevering behoefte aan hulp of begeleiding? Via www.inintensereis.nl help ik je graag verder. Op deze site vind je ook meer informatie over mijn boek Een Intense Reis. Luister je graag naar deze podcast? Laat de maker weten dat je waardeert wat hij of zij doet en geef een digitale fooi. Dat kan zonder abonnement, snel en simpel via fooiepot.com. Fooiepot met een d.com.